Okay, everybody, Matthew 7. If you could turn there in your Bibles tonight, Matthew 7. I want to, I want to uh, take some Sunday nights here on this particular subject, simply rock or sand. Rock or sand. You say, where did you get that idea? Well, from Matthew 7. It's better just to preach the Bible, right? We don't need fancy things or, or uh, uh, invent something new. The Word of God is where the power is. Matthew 7 and verse number 21 of Matthew chapter number 7. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Will you join me in praying for a moment? Father, help us to understand this passage, not just to understand it, but for me, I'm praying that it will find a a solid resting place in my heart and in my soul, and also in all those that are listening here in this place, also some listening online, and who knows, some may, that may hear this message years from now. In our day where things are recorded and they're archived and they're there uh, uh, in internet land, Lord, who knows, I just pray that you'll use this according to your will. I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Well, Jesus was the greatest preacher ever. Amen and amen. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 have been called the Sermon on the Mount. No sermon like it. Because there's no, never been a preacher like Jesus. Oh, there have been some great preachers through the years. I would not include myself in that roll call. But Jesus was the greatest of all time. This may be the greatest sermon of all time. So what we have read is the conclusion, because these are the last words. And, you know, a sermon conclusion, we're taught when, we, when we're learning how to preach that the conclusion's important. Uh, the conclusion of your message, the introduction and the conclusion are important times because you have to gain their attention by the introduction. And, and for the conclusion, you have to be able to convey the decision point. And so here's the Lord Jesus preaching this greatest sermon ever, the greatest preacher ever, and his concluding words is this illustration of construction. And by the way, it's good in messages to use illustrations, right? So he uses this illustration of constructing a, a, a house, building a house. And his point is, no matter how you build the structure, the foundation's the most important thing. Is that fair to say? The foundation's the most important. You can put all of the effort into the trim work and the paint work and the drywall and the, and the chandeliers and, and, the, and the electrical wiring and, and all of those things. But if it's not built on the right foundation, it will fall. And that fall is tragic. It's tragic. A fall like that is filled with regret. I was encouraged when I read the last two verses of chapter 8 that the Bible says the people, once they heard his message, they were astonished. And I, let's never lose our astonishment in Jesus Christ. He should still astonish us. 
and amaze us. Let's not lose our astonishment in the Bible, the Word of God. The people were astonished. The message was understandable. They had to understand it to be astonished by it. There's no sense giving a message or sharing some truth if it's not understood. So it was astonishing. It was understandable. It was doctrinal because the Bible says they were astonished at his doctrine. And doctrine means that there's important teaching in it. Boy, some of the things that are being pushed around today in Christianity are nothing more than uh, a few stories and a few quotes and, and, and some music. And there's no substance. Uh, I try very hard, and, and I know I fail in other ways, but I, I try to make the messages that I preach have, have Bible substance. Because stories will only get you so far. The Bible is where the power is. And so there was doctrine here. Jesus also taught them. It says in verse 29, he taught them. So this was a preaching slash teaching time. And both are important. He taught them as one that having, having authority, it is okay to convey truth as being true. You don't have to say that everything is maybe so, maybe not, what if, it could be, you, you interpret, you might. Jesus taught them as one having authority, and he also taught them in sincerity and genuineness because when they said not as the scribes, if you've studied the New Testament, you know that the scribes were fakes. Jesus said they were outside all white, but inside full of dead men's bones. They were hypocrites. And when Jesus taught them not as the scribes, this is what's so wonderful. The, the crowd that was listening said, oh, what he's saying, he means it. What he's saying, he lives it. What he's saying is, is not fake or phony. It's not a facade. It's real. It was an amazing time to be uh, present to hear the Lord Jesus preach and teach these great truths. There's a few things that I noticed that are happening in our, in our culture today. Uh, Relevant. Uh, relativism, atheism, and humanism is growing. And there's some other isms. I'll mention some other isms. Uh, but I want to share with you the definition of, of relativism. Okay, because I'm going to, through these messages on these Sunday nights, relativism is sand. Truth is a rock. So relativism means that truth is only right or wrong based on its relation to other things. For, for instance, circumstances, emotions, culture, upbringing. So truth is not really truth. Truth must always be judged in the context of other things around it. Or in other words, nothing can be true or right in every situation because the situation changes. So depending on what you feel or what you think or, or how you grew up or, or what, where you're from or, 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 or things that you perceive or, or circumstances that happened in your life, your truth can be your truth. And we're sort of, even as Christians, we're sort of falling into this trap with phrases like, you be you. Which really means, it doesn't matter what's true, you just believe whatever you want to believe. You be you. And it sounds so current and so hip, but I, I'd rather say, you be like Jesus. That's a good standard to be like Jesus, right? I don't want to be me, I want to be like the Lord. Because that, that, that's a solid place, not a relative place. I'm telling you, me being me isn't always a good thing. Can somebody say amen? Because <laughs> I think you being you isn't always a good thing. But be Jesus, be like the Lord. This relativism is, is, is spreading, especially when you connect it to something called cultural rel relativism, which simply says and conveys to us that the only way you can tell what's right and wrong is what the culture thinks. So whatever the masses say, or the group says, or America says, or, 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 or social media says, then that's what's true based upon the culture. Do you know if we build our life on that, that is sand. That's sand. Let me give you an example of how far this relativism is going. Um, in Canada, there's a, a woman by the name of Greta uh, Vesper, V-E-S-P-E-R. She's, she's an ordained minister in the United Church of Canada but she is a professed atheist. You heard me right. You can look it up yourself. 
In the United Church of Canada, Greta Vesper is an ordained minister. And she has publicly said she does not believe in God. And the church said, that's okay. (laughs) Why would that be okay? It's okay because we are in a day of relativism. Well, you know, if that's the way you feel, if that's the way you see it, Greta, if that's the way you understand it, if that's sort of the way you were raised, if that's the way you see things now, then okay, you be you. And it's relativism, and it is building your house upon the sand. What makes sand unsuitable to build on? I guess there were, you can mention several things. I put down, because it shifts. You know, you take a walk in the sand. What happens with every step? You know, squish, 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 push. You know, moving, moving, moving. What happens when you walk on a solid rock? It doesn't move. It doesn't move. The Lord Jesus said, it is much better to build your house upon a rock, something that's true, something that doesn't change, something that's time-tested, something that's stable, rather than building your house upon the sand. There's a lot of pressure that's swirling around us today in 2024, uh, and several things I think on these Sunday nights I'm going to try to touch on. I don't know if I'll get through all of this in the list but you know, there's, there's this idea of the church being relative. And we, we just went through COVID and all of those things. It, 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 you know, the question was, is church essential? And we'll talk about that. How about gender? That's, that's moving everywhere. And social justice and creation and science. And how does a person get to heaven? That's always changing. It's like it's, it's sand. It's whatever you think. The reliability of the Bible, the existence of God, the sanctity of life, the purpose for living, our personal responsibility, the value of our our feelings. Is man really good? Is, Is man inherently good? All of these things are sort of the way our culture is thinking right now. And I'm glad that the Bible has the answers. And the Bible answers, Jesus's answers, is the solid place. Because the answers the world gives to these things is like squish, 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 squish. And when you build your house on that, it will fall. It must fall. It's clear in our passage that we read that not only is the words that Jesus said important, but Jesus himself is important. You cannot separate Jesus from his words. You cannot separate his words from his person. If you'll look at verse number 21 again, Jesus said, Not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But in verse number 23, he says, I will profess unto them, I never what? Knew you. He changes the subject from what they were doing to the relationship that they had. It's not about what you did or what you said or what you accomplished. It is, do you know me? Do I know you? And the knowledge of the Lord to the person is the relationship. That's Jesus Christ. It's not about, well, he told us to cast out devils. He told us to do miracles. He told us to go in his name. No, but do you know him? Do you know him? It is about the person, Jesus Christ. And in verse 24 and 25, he says, not just that you should do these sayings. He says, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine. They're not just sayings. They're sayings of who? Jesus Christ. It's the person. Do you know the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone? Can we go to that passage in Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse number 19 tonight? Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse number 19. The Bible
Bible says in verse 19 of Ephesians 2, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Isn't that wonderful? Look, there aren't many races. There's one. It's the human race. And when you're saved especially, we're all part of the same family. We, we, we used to sing, I think, after every service, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in his... Oh, I forgot the words already. We used to sing it every week. <laughs> I forgot the words. Cleansed by his blood, joint heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm glad of the family, the family of God. We are the family of God. We are fellow citizens. We are not foreigners. No one's a foreigner in the family of God. There aren't any foreigners. We're fellow citizens, household of God. Now look at verse 20. We are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now what connection do we have to apostles and prophets? Here's the connection we have to apostles and prophets. They wrote it. God inspired them to write it. Prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and, and Hosea and prophets like Moses and prophets like John the Baptist. And then we have apostles like Peter and, and Paul and, 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 the, the early, and John. Those were apostles that God used to give us this. So our faith is built upon the apostles and prophets in that we have this wonderful word of God. But it also goes a step further. Uh, Jesus Christ himself being the chief Corner stone. Emphasis on the word himself. I guess I want to say it this way tonight for this particular point of the message. Let's make sure that we build our life on Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. The world may choose to build their life else, uh, uh, on, with, with some other foundation, but it's all sinking sand. The only solid place is to build your life on Jesus Christ. In the book of 1 Kings, the cornerstone is talked about, and it's, it's given, uh, the cornerstone is given some characteristics in 1 Kings. Let me tell you, first, it's, they call them great stones. The cornerstone in a building was usually the largest of all the stones. The one they set in the corner, the biggest, the strongest. It was also, it says it was a great stone. It says it was a costly stone. Out of all the stones they would build a building with in Bible times, the cornerstone was the most expensive one. So costly. And then it says this, it was great stones, costly stones, and it calls those cornerstones hewed stones. H-E-W-E-D, hewed stones stones. When the Bible says they were huge stones to lay the foundation, it means that this particular cornerstone, so much time was taken to make sure that this stone is just right. And they would hew it and chisel it and polish it and check it and hew it and chisel it and polish it and check it and straight edge and check it and straight edge and check it. And when it became a little bit out of skew, they would disregard that one and they would find another one and they would hew it and check it and, until they got this cornerstone so that on every face, on every side, as best as humans could do it, they made this cornerstone just perfect. And doesn't that just sound like our Jesus? So costly, so precious, so great, and so perfect. He is the chief corner stone. He is perfect to build your life on. Who else would you like to build your life on? A YouTuber? <laughs> Who else do you want to build your life on? An actor? Who else would you want to build your life on? Some media influencer? I was reading a book, they call these media influencers, they're called sneezers. We want to build our life on some influencer on, on uh, Facebook? Or, 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 a, or a TikTok personality? I'm telling you, people are building their life on those kinds of individuals today. An athlete, are we going to build our life on an athlete? 
when the Bible says we have Jesus Christ we can build our life on. And it is a solid foundation. Do you know the cornerstone gave a building symmetry? They would hew the cornerstone and construct the cornerstone to create the symmetry of the building. A cornerstone would also give balance to the building and beauty to the building and strength and usefulness uh, to the building. And once that cornerstone was set, by the way, I just enjoyed studying all this out. Once the cornerstone was set, it was unmovable. Well, I'm glad that when you get saved, you're saved forever. Amen? When he gets set in there, he's set permanently uh, in our life, unmovable. The cornerstone also gives unity. Where we are in Ephesians here, chapter number 2, look at verse number 21 again, where the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, that's verse 20, but verse 21, in whom all the building, you see those two little words next, fitly framed. I like those words, fitly framed framed. It's very descriptive to me as I see this one cornerstone and everything else just fitting around it. I wrote down here that the cornerstone gives unity to the building. Unity to the building. Everything else gets tightly connected to that cornerstone. Everything else gets tightly joined to that cornerstone. Christ unites, by the way, I know the world says Jesus divides. He doesn't divide. He unites. He'll unite a family. He'll give a family a commonality of, of, of foundation. As we had these four generations sing tonight this morning. I loved it. I loved it. Uh, he brings unity to a church. He'll bring unity to the country. Someone says, well, you have to be more tolerant of so many things to bring unity to our nation. Does it look like that's happening? Jesus Christ brings unity to a nation. Being tight to him and close to him and, 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 and being able to stand on him. It's the best place for a family to stand if a family will stand unified on Jesus Christ. It's the best place for a church to stand if a church will stand firmly united to Jesus Christ. It's the best place for a nation to stand if a nation will stand firmly on Jesus Christ. There are a lot of other things that people consider the cornerstones of their life. Uh, if, if you talk to people, and I encourage you, encourage you to do that, it's not long in a conversation with someone until the conversation sort of falls to their cornerstone. By that, by that I mean the conversation, if, if somebody's, you know, on this idea of gender, they'll start talking about that pretty quick. If someone has it, it, uh, the cornerstone of their life being their career, I promise you they'll start talking about the career soon. If someone has the cornerstone of their life as money, it won't be long till taxes or, or investments or whatever it is becomes the talk of the day because that's their cornerstone. The cornerstone may be athletics or politics or entertainment or whatever it may be. They'll start, they'll default to that real quickly. And isn't it good that a Christian can say, my cornerstone is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. I build my life on him. He is my cornerstone. And all the masonry fits around that cornerstone, around Jesus Christ, a spiritual house. Sand is not a suitable unifier. Sand doesn't unify anything. Sand makes things fall apart. It's only the rock that will cause things to stay together. And Jesus Christ solidifies families and homes and a nation. It's okay. We, it's all right for us to say Jesus is my cornerstone. It's okay. Not only does a cornerstone unify, but you know a cornerstone gives direction. When this building was being constructed and so many of us worked so many long hours, just, just on my uh, phone the other day came up when we were carrying in all the drywall through this door into this building. And the pictures showed up and many of you men were helping us carry in, you know, 300 sheets of drywall, which doesn't sound like much to you start carrying it. <laughs> And we brought in all that drywall, and I think this building has almost 800 sheets of 12-foot drywall in it. And, um, 
But I remember carrying all that in, and, and, and I, I really learned so much through the construction of this building, and I'm sure that many of you men did as well. But I remember when we brought in the masons, and, and we, had, we had already laid a foundation here, with, which was just a concrete foundation, but then we had to put some block uh, all around this building, and, and I think it was three, three tiers of block that had to be put, and I, I never really had watched that done much before, but uh, when we hired these masons in, it was the one thing we felt like we could not tackle. Uh, and I watched as they, as they did this so painstakingly. Uh, I was surprised they started at corners. Have you ever seen masons do that? They start at corners. So they don't set like a, a corner stone, but they start at a corner and they focus on putting like three blocks, two blocks, one block, sort of like a stair step on each side going 90 degrees. And they spend a lot of time on those one, two, three, four, five, six, 12 blocks, getting those 12 blocks to be just right at a 90 degree angle and exactly the direction the building is to go. Because the plot of this building, by the way, you can't just start building and it's like, Pern. So the plot of this building was set and they would take these corners and they would start at the corners. I thought they would just start and build a wall, but they didn't, they got corners done. And then from those corners, you guys that were here, from those corners, they began, and they got each corner just as tight and close as they could possibly get them. And then they strung lines from corner to corner to corner and started constructing the walls. You know what the corners did? The corners gave them direction. You want to know which way your family should go? Make sure Jesus is your cornerstone. You know how our church is going to know what way to go? Jesus has to be our cornerstone. You know how America is going to know which way is best to go? Jesus has to be the cornerstone. Because everything else is sinking sand. Relativism squishes under your feet. Changes all the time. The only one that can keep things straight in your life is Jesus Christ. And he has an amazing way of keeping things straight in our life. One last thing I want you to know about Jesus being the cornerstone. And it's mentioned several times through the Bible, so I, 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 we, we have to address it tonight. Do you know the cornerstone was rejected? It's mentioned over and over and over in the Bible. It's rejected. And, and, and the, 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 the background of being rejected is that before they would build a building, I mentioned earlier, they would make this cornerstone, and that cornerstone had to be checked and rechecked and checked and rechecked and checked and rechecked in order for it to be validated that this cornerstone is true, it is a right angle, it, is, it has flat faces, it is directionally the way the building should go, and so that cornerstone is checked. Occasionally, a cornerstone would have defects, and the cornerstone would be rejected. And the builders would say, we've got to get another one in here that's better. Do you know what our culture has done? They, not, 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 not in mass, but I'm saying this is what we see on many horizons. We don't want Jesus Christ anymore. We want another stone in here. We want to build on something else. And Jesus said, I know that I'll be rejected. Isn't that funny? Jesus said, I, I, I am the stone that the builders rejected. He said that in book of Acts chapter number 4, Matthew chapter number 21, the stone which the builders rejected, Jesus Christ. It should not surprise us that in order to be humanistic, you have to reject Jesus. In order to be an atheist, you have to reject Jesus. In order to practice uh, relative morality, you have to reject Jesus. In order to practice secularism, you need to reject, you have to reject Jesus. In order to practice liberalism, you have to reject Jesus. It's not so much really going on board with humanism or atheism, whatever it is. It's the rejecting of Jesus Christ that causes the fall of the house. Fall of the house. The Bible says this in 1 Peter, unto you therefore which believe he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed. They dismissed him. And by the way, the Jews dismissed Jesus. 
There are people around us that are dismissing Jesus. There are families that are dismissing Jesus. Our school system is dismissing Jesus. Churches are dismissing Jesus. He said, the same has made the head of the corner and a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient unto whereunto they were also appointed. So here we have offended and disobedient and stumbling, or he's precious. I'm not saying this in any bragging way, but to me, the Lord is precious. You'll get some flack and you'll get some pushback and you're going to get some antagonism if you share with people that the Lord Jesus is precious to you. But that's okay. Because there's no other way to build your life than on Jesus Christ. He is the cornerstone. I, I, I don't want to convince him. It's not my job to convince. I have to remind myself of that as a pastor. It's not my job to convince. The Lord has to convince you. You know, some of you tonight, you have grandkids who are sort of falling into this humanism and relativism and squishy sand kind of living, living on your feelings, living on whatever comes in your mind, living on whatever YouTube says. And I want you to know you can't convince them, but Jesus Christ can convince them. The Word of God can convince them. I heard someone say that if a man is persuaded against his will, he is unpersuaded still. Let me say that again. If a man is persuaded against his will, he is unpersuaded still. Jesus said there's a choice. You can either build your life on a solid foundation, which is me. Which is me, Jesus. It's me. Or you can build your life on the sand. Both of those structures are going to hit a storm. I don't know if you caught that in Matthew chapter number 7. Neither house avoided the storm. So if you think that your life in Jesus Christ won't have some hardship, you're wrong. It will have pain, it will have sorrow, it will have hardship. Christians have to endure it just like you say, well, if I live for Christ, I'm never going to face a problem. Yes, you will. But the difference is, your house stands and this house falls. And the reason I, I put in, in this subject for these Sunday nights, how, how truths to, to build your life without regret, is because I never look when a house falls, when any, you know, you drive past a fire or whatever it is, a house is destroyed. I never drive past like, oh yeah. You know, it's tragic. It's tragic. That bridge that fell last week, well, it wasn't even like, oh yeah, I'm glad it fell. No, we're not. Breaks our heart that it fell. The tragedy breaks us inside. When, when a person builds their life on the squishy sand of everything's relative, based on what you feel, based on what the year is, based on what the culture says, based on what the status is, based on what someone online says, based on what politics say, when, we build, when someone builds their life on that kind of squishiness, and then there's a fall... It's tragic. It's tragic. It ought to break our heart. But if we build our life upon the rock, the rains will come and the storms will come and the flood will come and, 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 the, and, and it will beat upon that house. But it will stand. It will stand. The world says you can build your life on other things. You can build your life on gender confusion. You can build your life on moral, you know, wiggle, you know, wishy-washy. You can build your life on spiritual, you know, uh, multiple choice. You can build your, and, and you can build your life on this relativism, and you'll be just as good and just as happy and just as well. No, you won't. Because it's sand. It's sand. Build your life on Jesus Christ. It will stand.